you'll get your songbooks out, we'll sing number 528, The Lily of the Valley. We'll sing the first and third verses, and then we'll have an opening prayer, and then Isaac will come and give us a lesson for our Bible class time. 528. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, a bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, and we're thankful for all the many blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for this time this morning that we have to gather together as your people and sing songs under your name and hear a lesson from your word. We pray that you will be with us throughout this time, that we can keep our hearts and minds focused on you, that we can shut out the distractions of the world and of our lives and focus our minds completely on you, give you the glory and praise. We pray that we will learn something and that we will take what we've learned and apply it to our lives and go out into this world and bring more lost souls to you for Lord there are many. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You know I hadn't really um, planned this out but um, walking up the stairs here today I saw that little plaque that you guys have that said you know, new building, 1977, I think it is, but it said established AD 33. I really like that. Uh, there's not any other, you know, so-called church in the world that can say that they were truly established AD 33, uh, which was Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. There's only one time that we've ever seen a true church established by Christ. And it was in Acts chapter 2. Today I want us to go through Acts chapter 2. And we're going to sort of look at the church of Christ. And we're going to look at the template that we're given for the church of Christ through the Bible. And how other denominations today measure up to the standard that the Bible puts down. So we're going to start in Acts chapter 2. We'll start by reading verses 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is one of the big things that we see as the Holy Spirit came down, it gave the apostles the ability to speak in tongues. It gave them the ability to, to perform miracles. And the apostles were the only people, only people who had the ability to pass those on to others through the laying on of hands. So, in other uh, denominations today, we have people who claim they can do miracles. We have people who say that they can prove that they are the chosen of God, that the Holy Spirit is, you know, in them and that they can still perform miracles today, which we know is not true, but 
How many of you in here have ever seen someone do a magic trick? There are several things that people do today that, you know, they are trying to deceive. There can be things that happen that they look one way, but they're actually are a completely different thing. They can seem like they're performing miracles, but in reality, it's more of just a stage show. And so the important thing is that the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost truly came down and gave the apostles these abilities. So today we're going to study the origin of the church, what makes the church of Christ the church. So the first thing is the purpose of the church. So we're going to look at the purpose of the church. So anybody have anything, what do you think the purpose of the church is? There you go, body of Christ. And so you can see that if we go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we see that Christ, as the head of the body of this church, that as the body, we all have our own responsibilities. You know, we have people who are here to lead songs. There are people who can lead our, lead our minds in prayer. There are those who lead our minds in remembrance of the Lord's Supper. There are those who conduct us in singing. There are those who may not participate in worship, but they work to just keep the church running. They work behind the scenes doing so much. There are people who pay the electrical bill so we can have these lights in this building today. There were the people who came in and spent their money to have this church building built so that we have a safe place to worship today. So as the body of Christ, we all have different things that we do that help the body of Christ function. So that's one of the purposes of the church is to be the body of Christ. The next thing is that as the body of Christ, we are also the bride of Christ. So... If we turn to Revelations chapter 19, verse 7. Revelations chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. We see here the reference to the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, the one and only the Lamb of God. And so it says we are to rejoice for, it says the Lamb has come, his wife has made herself ready. And then if we go up to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. It says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed to you one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In 2 Corinthians, this is a letter written to the church, and it's saying, here it says in verse 1, Oh, that you will bear with me, in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous of you with godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to come to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. As the body of Christ and as the bride of Christ, the church of Christ is betrothed to one husband, which says it's Christ. And so it says here in the end of verse 2, may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
Version there is referring to purity. It's, you know, being very undefiled. And so as the Church of Christ, we have to make sure that we stay undefiled as we wait for Christ to come. So as we are betrothed to Christ, it means that there is a time in the future. And when you're betrothed, there's a time in the future where you'll be joined together. But right now, it's a promise of that joining together. As the church, we are promised of that joining together when Christ comes back. So, we can only have that joining together as the pure virgins of the church, so that we can be pure and undefiled, so that when Jesus comes back, the church is exactly the way he left it, and it's exactly how it was set up in Acts chapter 2. So, today we're going to look at some ways that we can remain undefiled by looking at the template of how the Bible says we are to remain as a pure and undefiled church. So, the first thing we're going to look at is our worship. So, I'm sure we all know we have the five acts of worship in uh, the Church of Christ. We have the singing, there's praying, we have preaching, there's the Lord's Supper, and there's the giving. When all five of those elements are present and they are completed in the correct manner, we know that we can have a proper New Testament Christianity worship in the way that it's laid out in the Bible. The first thing we'll look at is sing. It says that we're to sing with just the fruit of our lips. Let's see here, Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, we'll read verses 15 through 20. It says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We see here that, you know, the days are evil. It says, it warns us that in these days, there will be times that, you know, we fall into trials. There are going to be evil days coming. And even now, we can be in those days where there are temptations. There are people that want to stop you. There are, you know, always things trying to get in our way. It says the days are evil. Moving on, verse 17 says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what will the Lord, what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is in dissipation, but filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we can see as singing, it's making melody in your heart to the Lord, speaking to each other. A lot of so-called churches today, a lot of denominations today, will use instrumentals uh, mechanical instruments in their worship and you see them say oh well it says that we're to you know lift praise unto God and for me you know a guitar or a drum or a piano that's how I lift my praise to God and you know that's how I worship God and as people say this they ignore these scriptures it says speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I don't know about you, but I've never heard a guitar walk up and say, hey, how are you today? I'm encouraged by you being here. We can't be encouraged by speaking by instruments. Instruments do not speak to you. They can make music, they can make mechanical notes, but they cannot speak to you. The next thing it says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Another thing that people use is, aside from mechanical instruments, there are, you know, biological instruments. There are things like clapping. We see people clapping all the time. And so these things are, again, things that we cannot use to talk. If I were to stand up here and just start 
you wouldn't know what I'm trying to tell you at all. So when you clap, it's not communicating anything. It says we are to sing, make melody in our hearts to the Lord, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, so that when we all sing the same songs together, we're all unified in a thought of lifting praise to God. A few minutes ago, we sang the song, The Lily of the Valley, talking about, you know, I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me, fairest of 10,000 to my soul. In that moment when we're singing, it directs all of our minds to that one thought of Jesus in a world of 10,000 other things we could focus on. He's the one thing I found to focus on. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He will never, never leave me or forsake me here while I live by faith and do his blessed will. Until we continue to do what he wants us to do, Jesus can't be with us. We have to make sure that we are doing what he wants us to do, and then he's with us. So that's saying, then we have prayer. We see that prayer is a time of reverence. Prayer is a time where we are to focus, where we're talking to God, we're asking him for help, we're asking him for you know, wisdom in tough situations. So we have singing, we have praying, there's preaching. The preaching has to be accurate. So if we go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 5. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and with prayer. So we see that it says in the latter times, there will be people who teach doctrines that are from the devil. They are from, they are not from God. And so as people who are trying to follow God, we should not be listening to these doctrines that are coming from sources that are not from God. Uh, so let's see. Anybody have anything that you can say is like one of the most common lies that's told by denominations today in terms of a doctrine? Something they say that, oh, you don't have to do this or something that you have to do that the Bible doesn't say. Anything like that? Baptism. Baptism, <laughs> yes. So you see all these things like the Catholic Church where it says, you know, you have... They're baptizing babies, and when you say that you're baptized, you know, they take a little water and sprinkle it on your head. Anything else? So we see, again, that, you know, the Catholic Church, again, there are more teachings around them that do not fit in with the template of the Bible. It says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding you to marry. One of the biggest things in the Catholic Church is that, you know, the Pope is not allowed to marry. The Pope is not allowed to have a relationship. Uh, the same thing with certain bishops and deacons and archbishops. Any certain positions in the Catholic Church, there are certain requirements. One of them is that you can be married. And so, here in 1 Timothy... The Bible says, it says expressly that in the latter times there will be those who depart from the faith. It's saying right here that in the latter times people will depart from the faith, that is the church of Christ. They will leave and they will give heed, they will listen to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So it says that here's what they'll do. They'll leave, they'll listen to other distractions and deceits and it says here's what they're going to tell you here's what those false teachings 
are going to say. It says it, they will forbid you to marry. It says they'll command you to abstain from foods. You think of churches like the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who still believe that we're under the, uh, the rule of the old law. So they still worship on the seventh day of the week, on the Sabbath day, on Saturdays. And you see that as they think that we are still under the rule of the old law, that there are certain animals that we are not able to eat that in the Old Testament would have been labeled as unclean animals. Animals like pigs. They say you can't eat pig. Um, I think it's fish. You're not allowed to eat fish. So all of these different foods you're not allowed to eat. And so it's saying right here that those who command you to abstain from foods, those who are forbidding you to marry, those are coming from places that are giving heed to the doctrines of devils. It tells us that we have to be careful to guard our hearts because there will be false teachings that try to work their way into our hearts. If we're not careful, we can listen to those if we're not willing to be discerning. Right? It says, forbidding to marry, commanding you to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. It says not only has God rescinded that old law so now you can eat those animals, it says that he's given them to you so that you can eat them. And so they're to be eaten with thanksgiving knowing that God created them for you. It says for every creature of God is good. Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So we see that the doctrine has to be pure and the teaching has to be undefiled. So we have the, the singing, we have the praying, we have the preaching. Next, there's the giving. So we go to Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. You may have the wrong scripture there. First Corinthians chapter sixteen. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. It says that, through the Bible and by Jesus, we're commanded to give of our means as we're prospered. And so, another thing that is shown by the Seventh-day Adventists, who still believe we're under the old law, is the law of tithing, where it is 10% of everything that you have will be given to the church. This is an Old Testament teaching. As it says here, it says, as you have been prospered. So there can be days, there can be weeks, even months, where, you know, you're going through a hard time, and it may be hard for you to give as much to the church as you once did. There may be times where it's uh, easier to give to the church as you once did. And so it says, as you prosper, that's how you give. So we have the singing, the preaching, the praying, the giving, and next is the Lord's Supper. This is where I go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. It says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. We see that the disciples and the apostles came together to break bread in the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. So, on the first day of the week, this is when we observe the Lord's Supper, which we see 
in Mark chapter is that the end here? Mark 14. Yeah, 14, 22. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and when they all drank it, he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say unto you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We see here the Last Supper and the institution of the Lord's Supper, where we see this memorial set up by Jesus, where he gives them this unleavened bread and says, Here, take, eat, this is my body. He's saying, in this moment, on the first day of the week, when we take that unleavened bread, that is a memorial. That unleavened bread represents the death of the body of Jesus Christ. That body is what Jesus gave up for us. And then he goes and says, here, take and drink of the cup. He says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. We see Jesus gives them the fruit of the vine and says, Here, this is my blood for the new covenant, which is shed for many. We see that that fruit of the vine is to represent the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us. So we have the singing, the praying, the preaching, the giving, and the Lord's Supper. We have all those acts. When though all those acts are in place together in the right way, that is when we have our proper Church of Christ New Testament worship as the Church of Christ was established in Acts chapter 2. So, going from here, it says that as the church... We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And here, just before in verse 24, it says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. We see that... The church, as the bride of Christ, is subject to the commands of Christ. Where it says in John 14, 15, that it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. So as the bride of Christ, as the church, if we truly love Jesus as the church, we will heed his commandments and be subject to Christ. Just as it says here in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, the church is subject to Christ. So we see that when we follow all of these things, that's how we can go back to 2 Corinthians 11.2 as presenting ourselves as pure virgins unto Christ. When we keep these things in line and we fall into that template, into the commands that the Bible has given us for how we are to worship God, that is how we can make sure that we remain pure, that we remain undefiled, and that we remain as the true Church of Christ, just as it was established in AD 33. And it may be that, you know, it's always as they say, the Church of Christ isn't the building, it's the people. So even though one day this temporary building will go away, as people we have an eternal soul, and as 
those souls gather together to join in the worship of God, we see that through this worship, we can continue to be in the church of Christ as it's commanded in Acts chapter 2. I think that's all I've got.